So welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, co-production and how we've worked with learners, particularly over the last three years with a program that we run called, uh, called Talent Match, which, which is a big lottery fund project that we've been running since 2014. And um, that's really kind of what we're going to be hanging most of the presentation on. So it's not directly about community learning and particularly not about the mental health research pilot, but we feel that there are elements of our experience that, will, that are transferable and certainly areas that we're looking to transfer across to our particular mental health research uh, work over the next academic year. So I, I think I'll, without further ado, I'll kind of do the share screen and hopefully straight on to the, to the PowerPoint presentation. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll pause every, every couple of slides and just see whether there are any questions in the chat room or whether anybody wants to unmute and um, you know, just ask any questions of myself or particularly of Chantel, because it's Chantel's responsibility to work with the learners on talent match around co-production, co-design, etc. So let's fire away and get on with. And it's already gone straight to the very end of it. Okay, I think really in terms of. Um, the agenda for what I think will be about the next half an hour or so. Just give you a little bit of context about Humble Learning Consortium because we're, we're quite an unusual organization from a learning delivery point of view. And then give you some background about Talent Match Humber, where, where that came from. Look at some of the, the, the kind of principles and definitions around co-production and then the implications that they, they may well have for professional practice. And one of the things that we do use within our co-production on Talent Match is something called Hearts Ladder. And again, we'll, we'll kind of run through some of the principles of that. And I'll, I'll let Chantel perhaps say a little bit more about what Hearts Ladder is and how that relates to the learning experience for the people that we work with. And then really just looking at some of the benefits and challenges of, of, of co-production and, and our, our experience around that. Again, I'll build some time in at the end for questions and hopefully answers. Um, but you know, feel free to kind of chip in through the chat room or indeed unmute and just uh, just fire away. So, Humble Learning Consortium, what are we? Well, we're a registered charity that was established in 2001. We were set up by the CVS as the Councils for Voluntary Service and Voluntary Actions in the Humber area as a response to the contracting opportunities uh, from the, what was then the new Learning and Skills Council that started in April 2001. So it was really a, a voluntary sector reaction to some of the opportunities that might come around by way of delivering community learning, European Social Fund, etc. As the name suggests, we are primarily based in, in the Humber sub-region, uh, north and south bank of the estuary. Um, but we do operate uh, across the whole of, whole of the Yorkshire area through a number of different contracts that we deliver. And I, I, I guess the split is round about 80% Humber based and 20% the rest of Yorkshire. And we, we have two really prime aims, charitable aims for the organisation. The first one is that we are absolutely about working with disadvantaged ind individuals and communities. That is, it is totally what HLC is about. Uh, and secondly, the other kind of string to our bow on that one is that we were set up originally to capacity build smaller learning providers, particularly voluntary community organisations, to deliver high quality learning at the time to add a learning inspectorate standards, but of course these days to, to offset standards. And we're currently a grade two provider and have been pretty much, well, have been through the, the lifetime of the organisation. So those are the two strands to it, disadvantaged learners and then working with partners, capacity building smaller learning providers. But quite uniquely, we do not do any direct delivery as an organisation. We're a management hub and we work through a series of partner organisations. So we're quite unusual in that regard. But we started in 2001 working purely and simply with voluntary community organisations and since then through a variety of different contracts that we've taken on board. Those partnerships have extended out and we now have a mix of 60 plus, I think it's about 62 voluntary sector, public sector and private sector partners with around 
70% of those partners being voluntary organisations. So we work with people like MenCap, we work with Mind, etc., who deliver learning, and we help to quality assure it, draw down the funding, and deal with a lot of the kind of quality and compliance issues that go with the funding environment. We kind of work with over 5,000 learners on average a year, so that's kind of peaked at around 9,000 in the busiest year that we've had. Um, this year, we're probably looking at around about 7,000 learners, and again, disadvantage, so we're often working with needs, people who are furthest from the labour market, etc. And our funding mix is primarily SFA. There's a lot of ESF co-finance in the mix. If you're interested in Brexit, how that goes in the next couple of years but also quite a substantial amount of funding through big lottery fund and a little bit through charitable trusts as well. So that's kind of where we're coming from. We've been around for you know almost 16 years, Yorkshire and Humber based, um, but this non-delivery stuff is, is, is you know, not, not saying it's unique, but it's certainly something that's a little bit different in, in the way that we can work. So our provision is, is a real mix. We Naturally, we do community learning. And what, what you're seeing in front of you there is on the slide is, is, is clearly the, the kind of contracts that we're operating and the age ranges that we're dealing with. So we're doing a lot of 19 plus adult work, but we do have some very specific areas of work such as traineeships um, and, and talent match, which I'll come on to in a moment that are aimed at the kind of younger age group. And we've also got something called Youth Employment Initiative. Um, it's probably about a dozen of these across England at the moment, Liverpool and various other places, which is, um, is a European-wide response to what was um, a real crisis in youth employment uh, a couple of years ago. It's, things are easing a little bit, but when you still see some of the youth unemployment figures in Spain, Greece, and in certain areas of the UK, it's still quite a live issue. So that's the sort of stuff that we deliver. And the thing I'm going to focus on now is, is Big Lottery Fund and, and the Talent Match Humber programme, which is aimed at 18 to 24 year olds. And that's where Chantel comes in. Chantel is our engagement officer who specifically works with the participants on that programme. So what is Talent Match Humber? It's, uh, it was a, a program that was run or, or, or launched nationally by Big Lottery around 2013, 2014, and you may well have heard of it. There are 21 different talent matches across, um, across England, from the southwest up to the northeast of England and, and kind of all points in between. And for the Humber area, which for us is four local authority areas, Hull, East Riding and North and North East Lincolnshire, we were given a grant of just over five million to take us through to December 2018. So it's a five year program that aims to support just short of 1,500 uh, long term unemployed young people between the ages of 18 and 24. It is very much about employment, so there are hard outcomes in there around moving people into um, employment, sustained employment, six months plus, and further learning. But also, with it being Big Lottery um, and Big Lottery's ethos around social inclusion, there is a lot around soft outcomes as well. So a lot of the work that we do on Talent Match Humber is not just about getting young people closer to the labor market and into a job and further learning, but it's also just about improving their self-confidence, their personal resilience, and the way that they kind of engage with, with the local communities. So I said earlier that as, as per our kind of raison d'etre as an organization, everything we do is through partnerships with no direct delivery. We have more than 20 organizations that help us to deliver um, talent match across the area. And, and what you see within the models of support are, are very high levels of one-to-one -one mentoring for, for the young people that go through those programs. Um, importantly, and kind of coming to the, the meat and drink of what we're talking about today is that co-production with young people is actually a contractual requirement from Big Lottery within their talent match program. So nationally, the whole program was co-designed with young people before it was even tendered out to organizations such as Humber Learning Consortium. And that, I think Big Lottery took almost two years from 2012 to 2014 to design 
what, what will this program look like? What is it that young people need from an employment and social inclusion program funded by Big Lottery? And given that Big Lottery were investing around £108 million nationally, uh, they felt that having that kind of co-design and co-production element with the young people who would ultimately benefit from it was, was absolutely fundamental. So each one of the 21 talent matches across England has to have co-production within its, within its delivery and kind of why wouldn't we? That's really where we come from. Um, unique, again, I'm not going to say, not necessarily uniquely, but within our own talent match program, we, are, we do have a budget, an annual budget each year for co-production of around £30,000. So that's kind of devolved out to the young people themselves who participate in the program to help them kind of co-produce and co-manage a whole range of services. And I'm going to give you some examples at the end, particularly through a couple of videos that we'll show where um, that kind of investment has been used. And I know, Chantal, did you want to say something about it? You don't feel that that money is always necessary no it's nice and um, it's it's definitely nice and it gives us the opportunity to really put the young people on the map regionally and really let them do their own events and have their own spending but you don't need it and um, a lot of the time we get from some of our providers saying you know we haven't got the money to co-design um, it, it's expensive we don't have the resources where you i i believe you don't really need the resources and um, all you need is the young people that you've got just to take their expertise and their knowledge of the current landscape of youth unemployment and take their kind of understanding and their their expertise of that issue and, and partner and you know couple it up with what you know to make a more tight and um, effective project okay thanks chantelle so we have, we have a couple of mechanisms within talent match that, that network the young people who are benefiting from so you know we're looking at I said 1,500 young people over five years. We're already close to that number and we're three years in, so we may well be looking at significantly higher numbers that are engaged. One of the mechanisms is something called the Young People's Partnership, um, and that really is just a, a kind of regular networking of, of the people who are involved in the programme. But what was spawned from that is something called PAD, which is People Against Disability Discrimination. And the young people themselves within the YPP, the Young People's Partnership, identified that there were very specific needs for a cohort of young people with hidden disabilities and disabilities. And again, we'll, we'll kind of come back to that because PAD's taken a bit of a life of its own yeah. on that, if I'm, I'm right on that one, yeah. Chantel. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions at that stage? No. Nothing in the chat room there, Sally? There isn't anything in the chat room. The last comment that Chantelle made, though, I didn't hear it clearly. I don't know about other people. Okay, I don't. Come on in, Chantelle. <laughs> what was it about, the, about PAD or about the funding for co-production? About PAD. Yes, so, so as Andy explained, PAD is a group of young people that identified their, their challenges in, in gaining employment because of their hidden conditions wasn't really necessarily their fault. It was kind of a train, it wasn't their own training need, it was a training need of the employers. So they, they started a small campaign two years ago and over the past two years that's grown and developed and now it's, it's really, really informed a strategic initiative that sits right across the Humber and it involves the LEPs and the job centres and businesses as well. But we'll tell you a little bit more about that towards the end of the, the presentation. Okay, so that's kind of, that's Talent Match Humber in a nutshell. We're three years into the five-year program uh, and learning a lot and learning a lot of, through the through the kind of co-production mechanisms that we use. So really, just what is co-production? I've got a, a NEF, a New Economics Foundation um, version on there, definition on there. Co-production being a means of delivering public services in equal and reciprocal relationships between professionals, people using services, their families and their neighbours. And then below that, uh, just a couple of quotes from practitioners, both locally and nationally, uh, around co-production as a process of active dialogue and engagement between people um, who use the services and those who provide them. And you might often hear it referred to as co-design, co-creation. I think for the purposes of this, we're, we're really kind of talking about interchangeable 
uh, terminology on it. So it, it is very much about th this kind of delivering services, be it learning, be it some of the services that we have through Talent Match, hand in hand with the people who benefit for, for ultimately from those services. Uh, and the implications that we, we kind of see for our practice and for practice in general is that, it, you know, there is a continuum between having a provider-led service and a, and a user-led service. And I think as we move through talent match, we're, we're getting a lot closer to kind of user-led end of, of things. Um, on other programs that we run, we probably would be far more towards the provider-led end of things. And I, I just wondered, maybe it's a, a point now just to, to ask participants on, on the webinar where, where they currently see their um, community learning mental health research sitting between provider-led and user-led where the people think they are. Anyone want to vouch on that? Does anyone want to either type into the chat pane or turn their mic on and speak? I mean, I'll say from our point of view, anybody come, from our point of view, I think we're we're much closer to the provider led than I, I, I want to be on, on the CLMHR stuff compared to, to talent management. Again, what, where are others on that? Well, we're also much more provider led. Um, you know, really, the, it, the extent of our co production is more or less the consultation with learners, although we've got a learner led um, group which meets on a, on a Friday. So we're trying to sort of add to that a bit more, and we've been discussing that this morning. But we are still, it's, it's trying to get that balance to make sure that we're providing the quality assurance as well as um, getting the co-production involved Absolutely. as well. Yeah, I think we'll, uh, that's some good, good points, Ellen. I think we'll come on to that in, in terms of some of the challenges as well around, you know, co-production is not, is not a straightforward process from our experience. Anyone else? Okay, so I think if we if we move on, uh, so again, kind of our, our goal in general as an organisation beyond Talent Match is, is for learners to be seen as equal partners, it, but not kind of leading that curriculum development. I think there has to be an element of reality within the co-production model for us that, you know, we do have areas of kind of expertise and something to say about programmes that we run. And, and I think learners as equal partners we've experienced with some of the organizations that we work with, surprisingly it has to be said, that for some of our partners, it can be actually too much of a radical change to be really involving learners um, in, in the development of programs. Uh, I mean, we've had some, some examples, quite frankly, on that one, that, you know, where they've actually said, we don't believe almost in the learner voice within this. They've not remained partners for very long, it has to be said, when they're, they're kind of coming out with that kind of, um, approach but again you know there, there are mindsets out there within some of the delivery partners that we have contact with that, that really don't see the value in, in co-production. It's usually the ones that are delivering something specific so if they're de delivering something but say ex vendors for example and they've got a, a whole lot of experience in their own professional background around working with ex vendors they sometimes you kind of get that that message that you know we've done this for years we know best you know, we know how the, the law is, we know how the policies are, we know what the, the provision is for that area. They don't necessarily, they look at more of the structure, then, then they, they use person's views and how they can enhance the project. Yeah. Can I just interrupt? Sorry, I didn't want to stop your flow, but we've had quite a few comments in the chat pane. People tend okay. to type than they do to speak. So Anna made a comment a little while ago, which actually you've just come on to, which is how do you manage the layers of partnership? And do you or the partners or both design the offer you, for your service users? We, we ne I mean, in, in, certainly in terms of talent match, we don't design anything in terms of the programs. Either. That's very much down to the innovation and, and the discretion of the partners that, that we work with. Um, so, you know, in, in so far as possible, clearly if we're working on apprenticeship programs or traineeship programs, there's a, there's a structural element to those that's almost non-negotiable. And I'll, I'll kind of come on to that in a moment because we, we've been struggling with co-production in, in some of the areas that we deal with because it is almost too procedural, too structured, etc. 
Chantel has the luxury with, with big lottery funding that there's a lot of scope to innovate within that program that I think provides you with co-production opportunities. I don't think you can really design co-production as well. A lot of the time you've got to go with the flow of talent match. We've got a lot of different styles of delivery right across the Humber. So if we would kind of redesign it, that would kind of take the co-production out of it. We need the individual projects to be designed by the delivery pro providers and by the young people that are on those courses as well. Thank you. Comment from Sue to say that she's always tried uh, for, the, for the mix of co-production, asking what learners want and responding to that along with working with partners to deliver what they feel is required. And Katina said, it's really interesting that for me, the volunteering session with Alicia and Helen the other day was all about co-production, but it's the language that gets in the way of us thinking about that or thinking that. So the term co-production feels a bit alien to us, doesn't that really? Um, so it's that term, I think. Yeah, um, well, quite, probably a question for Chantel on, in, in terms of the language that we use, particularly with the PAD group. How yeah. do we translate that so it's user-friendly? Co-production is... It, it's probably a term that, that we have always used. So in terms of talent match, we've used that. We used to use co-design, co but we've, we've kind of moved towards co-production because it kind of encompasses more of what we do. But we we did a lot of explaining what co-production was early doors. Um, because talent match is truly co-produced, and that is the message that comes right down to the big lottery and it goes right down to the learners. We haven't necessarily experienced that, to be honest with you. In terms of language barriers um, with, say, young people with learning disabilities, communicating and working in partnership with professionals, we've had to look at that. So in terms of not using acronyms, you know, just speaking in plain English, we've, had, we've come across language barriers in that sense. But no, we haven't really come across that in terms of the, the actual word per production. Something that we might have to think about with that's coming yeah. from your, yeah. your meetings. Um, Anna says that she's going to try really hard for year two of the projects or she's going to be working more with learner-led approach in year two. Um, Morwenna says that she thinks that uh, good community learning is responsive to learner needs and I think that would everybody across the board would say that. Um, so we kind of agree with you there Morwenna. Um, when it, it, everything you do needs to be quality assured. Um, I'm just going to flick through. Oh, it's flicked on a little bit more. Katina's just mentioned that, uh, as people are aware, the expert learner program resources that the uh, that Elsis produced um, hosted several mental health expert learner projects in 2011. Yeah, um, and she's also awesome. there to follow. Yeah, and, and NIAS have produced a number of um, kind of research and briefing documents around uh, co-production within community learning settings. So I'd recommend having a look on their website as well um, for those. I'll kind of skip past the final two bullets if, if I can, Sally, on um, the implications. I can, they're, they're kind of relatively self-explanatory, particularly the, the involvement of social partners, which is something that we just do. That is, that is everything that HLC is about. And, and kind of just look at the, the heart's ladder, which is the, the, the kind of engagement tool that we use to measure the level that our that both we and our delivery partners uh, are using, um, you know, in terms of their co-production with, with young people. So, you know, embedding co-production with, within partners' processes. So clearly what you see here is everything from kind of like no participation at the bottom, which is... You know, described as manipulation, quite a kind of pejorative term there, I guess, through to the, the upper end of the continuum where young people and adults are sharing decision making. And again, this is very much in a, in a talent match context, but thinking from a community learning that, it's, that you can replace young people with adults on that one and adults in terms of, you know, this will be adults and the, the providers themselves sharing the decision making. But interestingly, within Talent Match, we use this heart's ladder of participation to measure the effectiveness of the co-production of each of those 20 odd partners that deliver Talent Match. In a sense, we can rag rate them in, in, in the way that they involve young people. And the ones that are clearly 
further down the scale in terms of what we might call you know, tokenism or decoration in terms of arts ladder, we'd be looking at putting interventions in there or training and support for those organisations to encourage them and nudge them towards co-production techniques. And we expect every partner within Talent Match to be really working above this kind of young people are consulted and informed area within the set. It is actually contractually obligated as a subcontractor with us on that one, but you are working at least at that level. And we've had the ones below there who've, you know, we've effectively just said, thanks very much and, and walked away from those organizations. So it's it, clearly it's a tool that, that's used as that continuum, but it's also a tool that we use in a practical sense to gauge where we are at and where, where our partners are at. Anything to say yeah. on that, Chantel? Um, I think it's worth mentioning that it's, it's our young people as well from our young people's partnership that go out and do the evaluation. Because what we find is um, when we're evaluating projects in terms of co-production, we kind of, we get more from the, the beneficiaries themselves and the beneficiaries themselves feel more comfortable talking to their peers. So it's, it's our intent to actually go out and do, do this evaluation by speaking to the, the beneficiaries, finding out their experiences, finding out if they even understand what co-design means. And then they, they, they together come up with where they sit on that ladder. Then that's taken to contract meetings and discussed to ensure that the delivery partners you know, are in agreement with that if there are any issues. And then they play, they're placed on the hearts ladder and they get reviewed every, every three to six months. And the ultimate aim for us by the end of the contract is that most people are sitting within the top two steps of the of, of that ladder. Um, but I think it's all it's important to mention as well that not many people sit in the top one because that would for me that would mean that you've got really strong solid co-production in every area of your project, and sometimes that's quite difficult depending on the client group that you're working with. Okay. So just um, a few, just to break up the narrative and uh, throw in a few photographs. So if you kind of tilt your head 45 degrees to one side, what you've got there is that is actually the pad group, which meets every Tuesday. So if you put food on, it tends to really bump up the attendance levels on that one, it has to be said. Um, and again, do you want to just say anything, say anything about that, Chantel? Yeah, what were they doing with here they were design, uh, developing a, a conference as part of Humber Business Week last year, so they did a big event for employers um, across the Humber region just talking about um, how they've been involved in Talent Match um, and how and the issues that they you know, encounter getting into employment and how employment needs to change their recruitment practices to make their opportunities more available for people with hidden conditions such as learning difficulties. So they were talking about things like online application forms, but they they, they planned and hosted alongside us a, a big event um, that was quite prominent in the business week last year. So that's a very um, dynamic group that meets on a regular basis, uh, good attendance levels, uh, really good engagement, and they've been working around two years yes. now, two years yeah. on a variety. So it's not just about the programs within Talamatch. They're actually looking at stuff beyond that, almost you know, kind of social enterprise style um, initiatives that, that kind of are almost spin-offs from the Talamatch activities. This, this second um, image that you have there, and if, if any of you are rugby league fans, I'm not, but that's whole Kingston Rovers ground. Uh, this is called The Pitch. and. Again, within our model, when we commission the delivery partners, the young people themselves have a role within that commissioning process. So a delivery partner has to go to an event and pitch what their program would look like to you know, a group of four young people. And this, this helps to score the, the tenders within that. So that there's, a, there's a waiting within the scoring process that is down to in this particular case, there's four young people who are sat there um, and we've held this on a regular basis. And again, it gives that co-production ownership to, to the young people in Talent Match right from the very start. They're effectively picking, helping to pick and choose who the delivery organisations are through each of the annual commissioning rounds. Um, and we've, we've, had, we've had partners, delivery partners who've gone to that who said it's probably one of the most terrifying things that they've ever had, to, you know, as learning providers having to sit in front of, you know, the, the potential participant groups and, and pitch their ideas to them. But we feel it's a, it's a really important part of the process. 
And then the final thing that we had there, this was an event that we ran a couple of years ago, which was, again, this is completely co-designed and co-produced by the young people in Talent Match, which was a huge marquee in the centre of, um, of Hull, uh, with a whole host of employment-related sub-events within it, speed meeting employers, talks from a whole variety of speakers, including Thomas, Thomas, Thomas Turgoose from This Is England, who's a grim... Grimsby lad, so they, uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, he came along and gave um, an interesting, if uh, profane, profanity-laden speech, it yes. has to be said. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was, a, again, an interesting event. And again, I'll come on to one that we're doing uh, at the moment called Disability as, as, we, as we move further on. So just some of the benefits that we've seen from co-production. Uh, Clearly, it's a developmental process that becomes part of the learning process itself. Having those young people involved in running events, having them on the pitch where they effectively help as part of the commissioning process, it gives them you know, unique experience and adds to their skill sets and CVs. There's also the thing about sharing contacts, knowledge and understanding. The, viewing the young people, the learners, the participants, and this is whether this is community learning or talent match, it's looking at people as you know having assets uh, and really looking at people in a, in, a, in a different way and what they can offer. And this whole thing around extending learning to more groups, the PAD group itself almost becomes an engagement tool for talent match because the word of mouth that spreads through those kind of meetings is actually really powerful when, when peers are talking to you know other young people about talent match and, and effectively spreading the word. And that ownership we've seen does help the retention success rates and impact um, on, on talent match. Chantelle was saying to me when we were kind of planning this at the beginning of the week that if, if done right, co-production can be a really effective upfront investment because if you get it right at that point, then when you're into delivery of the programme, there are kind of less issues and less mistakes that, that occur. And we really found that over the last three years with Talent Match, that, that that's really benefited the programs that our delivery partners run. And I think the other thing as well is from a, the kind of practitioner side of things, it actually enriches the, the staff practices and, and our professional experience. Meeting young people on a regular basis and listening to what they have to say, I think has been really beneficial. Not only for you know staff like Chantel who are at the chalk face, but you know the administration staff, and it's just it's excellent CPD for us and our, our delivery partners. The breaking down of power differentials for an organisation like us that is very much about disadvantaged and marginalised individuals that's absolutely fundamental to, to to where we come from. And you know, as I said earlier, the things like the pitch and organising events just increases the learner confidence and skills, and we see that cascade, yeah, don't yeah. we, through through the, the pad group, etc. And interestingly, the, the, what I mean by the final bullet about building wider buy-in and adoption is that we we've seen partners delivering on talent match, and indeed organisations beyond that who kind of gone, what's, what's co-production about? And they're, they're kind of beating a path to our door to kind of learn more about it. And Chantel's recently been doing a secondment with the NHS two days a week to help them with their co-production um, in terms of a whole host of kind of patient involvement groups. Yeah. And that's to kind of ensure that they're meeting their quality and diversity needs. So they're looking at kind of making a lot more patient involvement groups within each service to make sure that they are doing everything for their patients and their patients are actually going to go to their management board meetings to help develop develop the trust. Okay, and uh, interestingly, the, the local en enterprise partnership in the Humber is really interested in co-production in a host of ESF programmes as a result of the work that we've done. So we, we've kind of got the years of some fairly major stakeholders with the NHS and, and the left and uh, come on to it in a moment with the, the first video is, is we're also working with other talent matches at a national level as well so we're really making kind of inroads um, at, at kind of local regional and national levels around uh, the use of co-production sorry can i just interrupt oh, yeah, again a few comments and things in the yeah. chat there. um anna's asked how long do people actually um stay in talent match typically 
It depends. It depends on the person. So what we say is um, we, we don't have set programs. Um, if they stay with us as long as they need to be on talent match because we're working with the hardest to reach in people, get the young people furthest away from the labour market. And it, and it totally depends. In terms of co-design, um, some young people have been with us since day one. Um, Angel, the young person who was our very first YPP member now works for us and she works for the CAD group. But we have some young people that come, have a really, really positive impact, give us lots of information and they progress. So we, we don't really put a time limit on anything. It's, it's got to be fluid and it's got to be for their needs, really. Um, and she's, she's also asked, how is this going to fit in with your research group? But can we leave that discussion till maybe the end? Um, we could do. I might have an answer by then as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah has said that um, they worked in a very similar way um, with their subcontractors in year one and she's hoping that she will be able to continue in line in year two yeah. in line with the group requirements. Yeah. Uh, a few people have had to leave but say thank you very much. So um, That's fine, I'm, I'm conscious we're, we, we will crack on because we, we're almost at the end of the uh, the, the presentation okay. itself I mean, a couple of videos to do I think going back to that point about how would you embed, embed this in the CLMHR stuff I think that first bullet point about program and qualification structures limits there is definitely a limit to co-production that is set by the type of program that you're delivering and I've not quite worked out in my head yet how that might fit with the kind of research requirements for year two and uh, you know I'll go away and reflect on that but as I said earlier, I think something like apprenticeships and traineeships, we kind of struggle to make an inroad on some of those programs because they are kind of very fixed. Talent Match has a lot of flexibility and I'm really conscious that that, that, that offers up so much for Chantel and the group of young people that we work with. But that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a limitation. The power dynamics within the groups themselves can be quite complex and hard to manage. You know, there have been issues within the PAD groups kind of within that peer group itself. There's a thing around relevance as well, which is how, how do you balance what the learners are demanding with actually the external demands from, from funders and the labour market needs. You know, it's, it's okay someone, a young person coming along and saying, this is what I want, but if, it, if it's kind of like totally unrealistic and irrelevant to what the funder requires, then in a sense that, that can be a huge contradiction and tension that we, we, you know, we struggle to manage, particularly in some of the, as I said, the programs like traineeships and um, apprenticeships. The lack of funding and resources, I think Chantel actually feels that that's not necessarily a problem. And I kind of agree that sometimes scarcity can be the mother of invention and sometimes not having the money can make you think in different ways about the way that you can involve um, people in, in these programs. Yeah, we was at um, Talent Match AGM yesterday and we were quite lucky in the Humber to have Bexdale from Pound E to do our co production methods and to develop projects within our young people's partnership, but not all Talent Match partners have that and they've still got some really, really strong co production methods because you know they'd be more creative with it and sometimes I, I look at them and I think maybe they're a bit more effective. So I really do think a lack of funding is, is, um, is not, not a big issue. Really. Yeah. And then the final point, I think a, a couple of people raised it within the chat room, is that if it's too kind of loose and, and, and amorphous, then it can actually be difficult to define and maintain quality. And, you know, I think pretty much everyone's going to be in an Ofsted common inspection framework situation on this one. Um, you know, that, that, I think that is a, is a real issue. So, you know, we, we are conscious that there are challenges and, and, and kind of constraints around co-production. I think just some hints and tips from our point of view, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap through these and then just get on to the, on, on to the two short videos, is that co-production does need buy-in at both a, a strategic and delivery level, and there's, there's something there about the culture and values of, of your organisation. And we have seen in some partners that that culture and, and the values aren't necessarily there. We have experienced kind of middle management decision makers who are resistant to co-production and, and when we've got underneath that it's very much because they're, they're being dri driven by results and not by the processes and so there's, there's a you know a level of understanding i think on our part we've seen young people coming to us who perhaps have hidden agendas about a service provider and use co-production as a as a an opportunity to get back at them you know that's 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 a risk and we have to kind of focus on the end game and make sure that we don't get 
lost in some of those agendas. A point that I come across through kind of working through with social innovation is we can't assume all of the time that learners will naturally innovate, that it's always there. And I think quite often they will bring life experiences to, to the table, but it, it's down to us as an organization and our partners to kind of shape that into something that, that works. And I think, you know, the, the facilitation skills are key to that. It can be a slow process. It is definitely not a, a quick fix. We're three years into this with, with Talent Match, and it's definitely not consultation. Consultation is not co-production. We feel that sharing information at the outset and being clear with learners about the resources and the time available is, is important. And we also defined what co-production was with them. So I guess that thing about us not really having a problem with terminology was down to us putting the groundwork in at the beginning. Uh, we commission and monitor co-production approaches using the heart ladder, as, as, as we mentioned. And a point that Chantel really came up with, again, in our conversation at the beginning of the week, is don't set out with fixed plans about what co-production will look like. It completely has a life of its own. And what you end up with further down the line can be, you know, it's not what you're necessarily expecting. It has its own journey. It has its own destination. But that's no bad thing as long as you're prepared to be yeah, flexible and stick with it. So, again, these are the guys that we're working with through PAD, and they've been involved in two things. The first video I'd like to show you, they're, they're only a couple of minutes each. The first one is some work we've been doing with Talent Match in Leicester involving young people in co-production quick vid on that one and the second one is a new program that we're setting up and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Hopefully this will work. Hidden Talent is a project that came about when we realised lots of young people within the Talent Match Leicestershire projects were not getting jobs and they weren't getting jobs because of their hidden disabilities and hidden conditions. Everything that we're doing talent matches is co-produced. On route to Tanner Match Combat in Hull. We've been kind of working alongside each other on, on the same subject, but in, in slightly different ways. And maybe seeing where our projects uh, can intertwine and come together. We are here acting purely, if you like, as a conduit to capture some great ideas. So the aim of the films is just to sow the seed in people's head that actually there's something special here and let's get on board with it. If you wanted to find out more about hidden conditions, how would you go about it? Google. We need to get better at this because if we keep on doing what we always do, we'll only ever get the results we've already got. And there's a lot more we need to do. So if we had a situation where a person came in with a condition and they disclosed that condition to us before we made a decision, we would obviously need to go and find out more about it. We've done the textbook stuff that the job centre would say, this is effective job seeking. Folks, it's not enough. So what I'm hoping that these films will convey is that, is that employers should focus on what the individual with the hidden conditions and disabilities can do rather than what they can't do. Many boxes don't understand what a hidden condition is. The lack of understanding, I think, is one of the biggest uh, barriers. And if they can understand what the condition is, how it might manifest itself, how it can be worked with, and, and most importantly, how you can get the best benefit from it, then I think integration becomes easy. I think that there's a long way to go, but it's a really uh, exciting space uh, to be looking at and to be working on. I wanted to do the interview just to get a sense of like the support in the uh, work, uh, in the workplace available to people who are hidden. We also need to show employers that really diversity is key to innovation, and innovation is how businesses grow. So that's a video of some work we've been doing in Leicester where we're, we're gonna, looking at producing uh, an animation for the you know, kind of journey that young people have into employment. The second bit, and we're almost finished now, is uh, we've got something called Disability that we've, we've co-produced, co co-designed um, new 
service that we're offering to employers in the Humber area. So we've kind of flipped the support model with this and we've gone away from you know, just supporting the young person into employment and actually started to look at what support an SME potentially wants as well. So again, just a couple of minutes and this was the launch event that we had uh, last week at Hull Truck Theatre. a renewed focus on making sure that we are attracting and retaining disabled talent because we know that it's just a fantastic talent pool that we want to have more of. We want to be representing of society in the UK. The feasibility study is looking at how we can support employers to employ young people with hidden disabilities and indeed with physical disabilities. So we've kind of flipped the model and, and started to look more at supporting employers uh, because we, there was a need for that that had come through from the work that we've been doing at Talent Match over the last three years. Well, through events like that we've done today, what um, I'm sort of really keen to do is to get those messages across to employers that there's help out there. It can be difficult to sort of know where to access that. There'll be a sort of simple page where they'll be able to sort of go and find out more about that. I love the work of the in the brand, working on the till um, customer service, saying hello and being polite to them. And walking in with a smile on your face, and just asking if you need any help. <laughs> I love drawing the brands. This is a view that's shared across the political spectrum. For too long, disabled people were marginalised in our society, they were institutionalised. The skills and talents that they possessed, enormous skills and talents, were never put at the disposal of employers. You need a cultural change, and that's what this event is all about. Last word to Chantel. Just wanted to kind of mention um, this. The video you've just seen is a product of our really, really early co-production with PAD. Um, it was always their vision to really, really reach out to employers and help employers employ people with, particularly people with hidden disabilities. So this is this has come from co-design. If we didn't work with young people and if we didn't co-design and talk about this issue, I really, truly don't believe we would have got to this point in the Humber. And now we're working with like the local, the LEPs, we're working nationally with Access to Work and Disability Confident. And that, that this is a real true product of co-production. And that's it from us. Sorry, that's 55 minutes. That's shocking. I thought 30 minutes. There you go. Thanks for sticking with us, you brave souls. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Andy and Chantal. That was really interesting. And as people have been commenting, that it's been really interesting. There have been lots of comments and information in the chat room, which they've all seen. But of course, because you've been sharing your screen, you haven't. So what I will make sure I do is save the chat and send it to you, so you get to see it as well. Um, do we have any questions from everybody in the room? No, that were great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I'd like, hi, Andy and Chantel. Hello. Hello. Hiya. Hiya. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And your visuals and everything was, was really, really good. Um, can I ask, when people are, are coming on board, what tends to be the level of confidence they're coming in when they're first starting out and they're on that co-production. Um, yeah, that I'll pass that to Chantal, that's a great question. I think it, it, it definitely depends on the person. And um, some people come in really, really motivated, really, really wanting to get stuck in, and they, they tend to be the more confident young people. But we have a lot of young people that just come in and sit, and they listen, and they take it all in, and then they don't start to contribute till maybe three, four months down the line. But when they do, they tend to kind of 
give us a lot more because it's yeah. more we've thought about it they understand the code production more they understand the issue they understand why we're doing it and a lot and that was what happened with pad it was that kind of slow like slow burn that really really started to ramp up after the first the first year so sometimes if you feel you're maybe not getting as much back just keep sticking with it keep having your meetings keep talking to them and then usually you find that engagement and that relationship really helps with co co production as well can i ask and how do you work with any kind of um, additional learning needs like such numeracy or literacy or anything like that in terms of co-production we don't we don't directly deliver at talent match we, we have providers that do that but they, they tend to use things like pictorial resources and they do it with functional you know use functional skills embedding embedding you know learning in, in different areas and um, that's maybe a question that I can take back to Mencap for you and just yeah. find out a little bit more about that and, and give you some some feedback there yeah that would be interesting I think because I think especially when we're working with um, some of our learners and they might just have um, a little little tiny additional needs that you know a tutor doesn't need to know a lot but needs to know something to make sure that they don't feel left out and to make sure they're able to come back the next week. Because obviously you've got a very high retention, so it would be really interesting to know, you know, how you're able to, to reach everybody with, you know, 20 people, 20 different needs. That's yeah. really good, well done. What, what I would say is in terms of working people with just additional learning needs, it's, just, it's like what we say to employees, just have that conversation on, on how they learn and what makes it easy, you know, easy for them. And yeah. sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking that we need to know these answers ourselves without asking the questions to the learner. So I maybe just put it out there and, and, and just have that open dialogue about it. Yeah. Thanks, what, work, what works for you, how best you learn? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Anna. Anna, one of the things I was going to raise was around the use of digital technologies and actually the co-production where you were talking about apprenticeships and traineeships not being able to change the programme. One thing that you can work alongside the learner is making sure that the delivery of the learning meets their needs, which would also meet any additional needs. So thinking about how you can make learning available at times when they're not with you and how you can still provide that support. Yeah. That I, I think you, ha you have to attempt, sorry, you have to attenuate and change the co-production model according to, you know, the, the types of provision. We're, we're con we've really found that out, as I said, with Talent Match, they've got a, a huge amount of flexibility that some of the other contract managers within HLC uh, perhaps don't have that advantage of. Katina's just written a question. In terms of retention, is that part, is that in part because young people have to be EET? Have to be what? Sorry. EET. I don't know what the EET stands Employment for. Employment education and training. Employment education and training. And no, not for us. No, not for Telematch. It's not mandatory programs. So, um, we uh, our retention's not. You know, they're not they're not mandated to a talent match program so we expect our providers to retain young yeah. people using co-production methods and the pack group's a total voluntary group so it's it's additional to their the projects that they're on it's something that they run themselves it's it's theirs so yeah. they don't have to be there there's probably a counter argument that our high retention rates are because it's not mandated the voluntarist you know the voluntaristic element within it is people come on their own free will but there you go we perhaps need to do more research on that to make sure that I can back up that particular assertion. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, well, thanks guys. It's been a pleasure. I hope it has for you. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Thank thanks you. a lot. Bye. Cheers guys.